Hi, I'm Kelly Hushin, and we are here at ProcureCon. I'm here with Paul Perry from Nokia. Uh, you just sat in on a roundtable, correct? You yes, led a roundtable. And what was the roundtable topic that you were discussing? Well, it was about travel, but within that category, it was more about how to affect long-term, sustained behavioral change in a global organization. And what is what is this whole talk about travel? I mean, for me, this is something that I'm sitting in and I'm hearing a lot of people kind of even complaining a little bit about this whole travel <laughs> thing. Um, well, what is what is it? Travel travel is a is one of the areas in a company that is true discretionary spend. Right. So it's it's one of the first things that companies look at when they want to try to reduce their operating expenses, save a little money. It is an area that that you can reap some some cost savings. Um, but for us, it's, it's more about just cutting travel. It's, it's about changing people's behavior so they sort of think about travel differently, that it's not the, the first way to achieve business objectives. Um, right. And that's the approach we took, is that um, what needs to travel is your work product and your ideas, not so much your body. So if there's a way that you can affect that and effectively communicate or, or engage with a group of people without physically getting on an airplane, then, then that's a good result. So that's what I was talking about this morning, is how to, how to change people's hearts and minds and the way they think about achieving business objectives. So driving to the airport is not their, you know, not their first choice to get that done. What was the response? Did you see people kind of on board with what you were saying? Or? I, I did, and I, I kind of saw people that, that went through the same thought process that we did initially at Nokia, that, well, why can't you just change the policy and tell people what to do? Well. What we found is by taking the approach of educating people, um, you know, you have auditory learners, visual learners, experiential learners, so to provide information to them in a context that culturally is acceptable in a way that allows them to absorb and learn, but also a message that's near and dear to their hearts, be it the environment, work-family balance, um, efficiency at work, or cost savings. Uh, provide the information to them in that way, then it's something that's important to them. It's in a way that they can learn and understand and that culturally is acceptable. And then we find that once people understand, then they change their behavior accordingly because now they have a good reason to do what it. What is the, um, the overall procurement organization like at Nokia? Are there lots of divisions? Can you kind of just break it down as a whole? Like what does the procurement well, team look on the, like? On the indirect side, mm -hmm. which is on the, you know, the stuff that it takes to run the company, not what goes into the sure. products, it's a global team platform base. So regardless of what division you're in or what part of the company you're in, we service those requirements. Right. So it's, um, it's an overall management team that is structured sort of by category, travel, IT, services, um, you know, different, the different categories. But it's also got a geographic component. So there is a sourcing group, for example, in North America. There's one in Brazil, one in India. And we work together strategically to provide the, the strategy from the category level, but then the resources from the sourcing level to right. actually execute projects. How big are we talking? How many people on these teams? Uh, total indirect is about 370 people, I think. Globally. Globally. So how do you work with internal teams at Nokia and at your indirect spend and global travel uh, division to um, streamline your, your procedures and how do you kind of get everyone to, I'm just kind of looking for the, um, your strategies. Uh, that you know that you use for your internal teams. When you say work with teams, the mm -hmm. teams in indirect sourcing or teams? Indirect specifically. Ah, okay, well I have a, um, like all the other categories, I have a very small team. It's five people. Okay. But each of those guys owns a subcategory. For example, I have a guy here in the Dallas area who owns the airline relationships globally. So it's up to Bill, his name is Bill Yeoman, and Bill's a guy that develops the strategy for how we're going to source airlines for the next year globally. Wow, right? okay. Now he does that in conjunction with a lot of groups. And he also works with our geographic based sourcing groups who are spread out all over the world because they're the folks that um, that have to do some of the some of the work with the regional airlines, for example. Mm -hmm. So it's the strategic work is done at the category level, but the execution is done at a, at a different place, in a, in a geographic organization. They, the sourcing org, as we call it, the sourcing organization provides the manpower and the muscle to execute the strategies. 
Okay. So what are some, if you can talk about them, uh, some new things happening at Nokia that maybe you're getting involved in? Any new developments or any kind of new strategies that you guys are implementing? Um, any Anything that's kind yeah, of up, travel up from, and coming? Yeah. Um, well, specifically from travel, because I would assume that's what right. you have more of a, a role mm -hmm. in. Uh, but then, you know, anything else if you want to talk about? Well, there's, a, there's a couple of areas. I mean, when you, when you look at, at our world, some of the growth markets are India, China, Middle East, Africa. Right. Um, these are areas that don't have, let's say, the most mature travel systems in the world. So we're having to really focus on making sure that our employees in our growth area countries have all the services and support that they need. So we, we spend quite a bit of time doing that. And that's done through the local sourcing organization. You know, I work with the guys that are that live in Dubai, that live in Chennai and in India, that live in Beijing and, and Singapore, and we, we um, implement the strategy for those areas. Is it challenging to do that? I mean... Yeah, it sure it is. Yeah. I mean, if it wasn't challenging, I wouldn't want to do it. I'd be right. Bored. Yeah, that's true. But, um, so that's one area that we're doing. But then we started about a year and a half ago, yeah, about a year ago, we started a consultancy service out of my group. Now, when you say consultant, people automatically think I went out to a Deloitte and hired a guy. No, yeah. not at all. We, we do this ourselves, and we take consolidated data and go work with individual stakeholder groups around the world to talk about their behavior and their compliance and the way that they use their corporate travel money. I see. And we try to work with them to change their behavior, to spend a little smarter, sort of like, you know, traveling shouldn't be your first choice, mm -hmm. but if you, if you do have to travel, then you have the responsibility to do it a certain way. And, and here are the things that, you know, that your particular team is not so good at, so let's work with you to change that behavior over time. So right. we, we do that as well. So that's, that's not exactly traditional sourcing. It's not out negotiating contracts, but I'll tell you, anybody can go squeeze 3% out of a hotel. Mm. But change a group of 100 salespeople's behavior, now you've saved some money. Do you see them times. reacting to these things? Do you see it changing? Absolutely. Um, and, and the way you do it, in fact, that was the subject of the roundtable this morning, mandating change is not effective. Mm. In fact, in companies that I've seen put in travel bans, for example, the day they lifted the ban, the entire company ran to the airport simultaneously, right? And you're back to your pre-ban travel behavior and nothing really changes. Right. But when you take the time to show people, look, this is what business travel does to you, to your family, to your health, to your group's productivity, to the environment, to yeah. the company's bottom line, this is what it does. Now let's talk about ways you can make a better contribution. Now, I was telling somebody this morning, in my case, I got five kids, right? So yeah. in my case, work-life balance is really important. Yeah. So if I can eliminate an overseas trip and do a video conference instead in the middle of the night for a couple of nights, but sleep in my own bed and still make my kids band concert, that's a better solution for me. So what we've tried to do is to give this information to people in a way that they will understand it, either visually, experientially, or auditory, uh, or visual, or, but also a message that's important to them. Yeah. If the environment is important to you, I can show you how your travel negatively impacts the Just environment. Just one person's travel. In terms of do. CO2 emissions and all of these things, and I can say, look, there's a better way. Right. You, know, you, can, you can reduce your your impact on the environment by doing these things. Right. So when you do it in that way, and you teach someone, here's the result of your behavior, here's what you can change and how that's gonna, it's, it's the old, it's so basic, it's the it's what's so in basic. it for you question. Right, that's what, and, it's always the question, and right? And if you can answer the what's in it for you question, then you can change behavior. Yeah. Capturing hearts and minds. Yeah. Now I did a little background. Um, you have an attorney's license, right? Don't. That's yes. I can't I'm, bring I'm that a, up. Well, no. Of course you can. I'm a recovering attorney. A recovering yeah. attorney. I was just curious to know, you know, how you transitioned into this kind of a role and oh, what, what, if that plays well, any I've, role in your I've current been position. In, uh, well, it always does. I yeah. Mean, it's, yeah, I do have a law license in Texas. I've been an attorney since 1993. Um, and any time that you're dealing with contracts or dealing with business dealings between large companies, especially a global company, the legal knowledge is, is uh, it's invaluable. It really is. Yeah. And it also teaches you a little about negotiation. I mean, attorneys, some of them are pretty good negotiators, and, and I, I learned from some really good, skilled people. But uh, I've been in strategic sourcing, materials management, buying, 
It's, it's kind of whatever the, the title of the month is for the same function, it changes from time to time. <laughs> but I've been in some sort of supply chain type work my whole career. Okay. I went to law school at night, so it was a, kind of a, in, oh, in the middle of things, okay. I, I went and got another degree. And, uh, thought about practicing law, but, but just a uh, family situation, it didn't work out, and here I am talking to you about travel. Well, hey, I mean, it seems like you so, did the right thing. Five so kids, far, so you know, good. you don't, you <laughs> wouldn't want to replace that with anything. Um, my last question for you is really just um, besides travel and all these issues surrounding travel, mm -hmm. what do you think some of the biggest challenges facing uh, large procurement organizations are today? Ooh. Uh, complacency is, is a killer. Um, not opening your eyes to new opportunities is a killer. And the way the reason I say that, it's mostly from an indirect perspective, but you can spend your time looking at spend numbers and going and negotiating two or three percent off of that. And you can save a little money and you'll be very successful in your career. Or you can go to people and be an enabler of something that they didn't have before that allows them to achieve some bigger objective. And now you've affected the company's sales revenue or you've opened up a new market for them, or essentially you've brought the power of the supply market into the four walls of your company to change a fundamental way of doing business. Mm. So I think procurement organizations and sourcing people sort of forget that we're supposed to be experts in certain areas. I mean, come on, a trained monkey can get three bids in place of PO. Yeah, right. yeah. That's 1970s stuff and that's gone. But what it takes today is a professional that can get out there and understand the supply market, maybe in a certain area or maybe overall, if you're in a leadership position. Bring the power of that to your organization and say, let's talk about how you can do something different or utilize this service or structure this differently. Or maybe leverage by with another company and how we can do things differently and achieve the overall strategic direction of the company, not just your little corner of the procurement. Right, a larger focus, so to speak. Bigger picture, bigger, bigger view. Bigger picture, yeah. right. Isn't that the case for everyone today? Could be. Could be. <laughs> well, thank you so much for sitting down with me thank and you. chatting, and I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. I and will. We'll check back in and see if you learned anything new. <laughs> I hope I do. That's